Hey, what's up guys? I am Steve from Workbench. That's a joke for eight of you. And this week we're gonna talk about generative art inside of After Effects. As always, this tutorial is just the beginning. I'm hoping you guys will take this and run with it. But if you wanna know more about any of this stuff, there's a project file available. Although beware because of the way this works and how intense some of it is, there are some weird errors that pop up but they're really not actually expression errors. They will go away as you work with the file. It's very interesting, and I'm sending a file to Adobe to check it out. But yeah, it's, it, it's all good, don't worry. So the basic idea is that we have this grid of master properties comps, and they all have consistent inputs that we can either choose to use or not, depending on what kind of block we wanna put in here. So in this particular example that I used for the slides from my recent talk at Keyframes conference, I used a grid block. So we have a grid of grids. And the density of each block's grid is dependent upon the underlying source footage or graphic or whatever. In this case, it's my slides and they're all in black and white. So if we go through them, they look like this. It's pretty simple, it's just black and white imagery. So let's go back in the main comp and see how these things are actually built. This tutorial is brought to you by Stackit. That's what we're using to make all of the grids in this thing. Check it out at workbench.tv. So if we uncheck this little shy guy here, we have like 576, I think, layers of this grid. So you can see as I go over each one of these things, it's a little block that gets highlighted in the comp. So if I open this up, we're gonna hit EE. I'm gonna just copy this expression up into here. If you actually go through the slides in this project file, you'll see that I've built this in an unoptimized way at the beginning, and then this is the optimized way. Initially, I was actually calculating out a brightness value based on RGB values and all sorts of junk. But since I'm just using black and white, or you can use a tint effect or whatever, I only need one channel's value. So I set this up with a controller, and the controller has a layer control so that we can pick which layer our map comes from. So that's just basically that slides comp I showed you before. So we pull in that controller as our first line, set that to L. That's gonna be our variable for layer. B is gonna be our brightness, and that's gonna be equal to the layer dot sample image position. So the position of this particular block, whichever block we're calculating it for, with a radius of five by five. These blocks are 60 by 60, so that's a pretty good way to average it out. I'm pretty sure that if you make this higher, that it'll take a little longer to calculate. But if I made it really small, you get a lot more flickering depending on what's under it, if it's moving footage. And we're passing in this other argument true, and that's for post effect, which means if we set this to true, it'll calculate the color of the layer after effects have been applied. In this case, we could actually speed it up by telling it false, because I don't really have any effects applied in between but this is a little bit more versatile for whatever you're gonna build. So then all we're gonna output from that is the first array position. It doesn't really matter which color we're gonna use, so we're gonna use the red channel. Initially, I was passing this into this density value. Later versions of this, I made it into brightness and noise, because I was doing this a little bit differently where I would calculate what values the master property was looking for instead of just passing it the actual raw data of the you know brightness. Other versions, I also passed in a noise parameter and that was for a noise function to make different randomness and whatever, but we're not using that in this tutorial. So if we go into this grid block layer, you can see how this part is set up. The only thing we're changing in here is the grid width. I've set the border to 0.5, and that's about it. So let's open this up in Expressionist as well. It's pretty simple. So we're gonna set up a variable B for brightness again. We're gonna pull in a master property from this controller. So this is my brightness slider where our value is passed into. So we're gonna take that slider value and we're gonna multiply it by eight because I want eight levels of density for a grid effect. So then I floor this because I don't want any fractional amounts. So if it's one, I want it to be one, not 1.1. 1 .1. So we're dropping off any decimals that are left over after this multiplication. So then we're gonna check and see if B is less than one, we're gonna set B equal to 0.5. I don't want B to be zero. And I'll explain why in a moment. So whatever B ends up being, we're gonna divide 30 by B. So in this case, if we end up with that 0.5, instead of being 30, this will be 60. And 60 is our block width. So basically, what would have been zero will end up being a grid that is a 60 by 60 box. So the edges will be here. That's why when there's zero values or like just black, we don't end up with holes and the grid is still continuous. But when B gets to be a larger number, like one, that means we'll have 30. So the boxes in here will be 30 by 30, which will give us one split in the middle in each direction. 
and then two will be 15, which will give us four blocks and so on. So it just becomes more dense as it gets higher. So as brightness increases, density increases. And that's pretty much it on how that's built. So as we go through these slides a little bit, you can see some parts get pretty dense when they get bright. And interestingly, based on where the actual sample image is taking place, like in this case, there's like a hole here in the middle between my name. It's just black. So the same thing for these over here over the frame number with the slide number. You end up with black holes and then dense parts at the bottom where it's actually sampling from. So that's kind of interesting. It's basically at this point generating itself using whatever you put under it. So it's pretty cool. So then one of the other things I made that was kind of interesting is this other one called Geometric Shapes Small. This one takes a little bit longer to calculate, although not that much because it's not a super intensive calculation. We're basically doing the same thing in these layers. Open that up and click this guy, bring it into here. You can see this is actually the older style of the way I'd set this up. So you can kind of get more of a contrast. Even though I used the brightness term in here, I'm actually calculating out this brightness. So it could be even faster. Anyway, so this version has our RGB values divided by three, and then multiplied by 255 to give us a full on brightness value. But pretty much the rest of this expression is the same thing as before. So if we jump into this geometric block small, we can see how this works. So if we look at this shape layer, we have this expression on points. We can copy that in here and paste it in. So here we're bringing in that brightness slider and then we're gonna modulus it by six. So that no matter what, we're just gonna get repeating values of zero to five. Then we're gonna floor that to make sure we only have integer values and we're gonna add three to that. So instead of our range being from zero to five, our range is gonna be from three to eight. So we're gonna have triangles over here, up to octagons at the very end. So you can see it just keeps repeating which shapes we have. Then down in stroke width, I have this set up to do the brightness slider again, divided by 255, so our range is from 0 to 1. And again, in later versions of this, I just pass it a 0 to 1 value. Then we multiply by 7, so that range is from 0 to 7, and we add 1 so that's 1 to 8. So that our stroke width here grows from 1 at the beginning, to eight as we get to the end of the range. I have the slider keyframed up here from zero to 255, so we can scrub through this thing and see what we get. So down here, the only other thing we have is this really simple expression, and this is just to keep the stroke on the inside as it gets bigger, and it's just negative, that stroke value, just pick whipped, divided by two. Because of the amount of layers and things in this, it's a lot slower to render than most things. You might be doing some stuff overnight depending on your setup. Um, I've also done some more complex things that actually were just used for mats, so I didn't really care how long they took to render, but it's going to be up to you and your mileage will vary. And still, so the only thing that's different in here is that we're multiplying our footage back over top so that we have color instead of just a black and white image. And that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed this one and take it and run with it. If you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comments down below. And if you're not subscribed to us, subscribe because we can do one of these things every week. If you like what we do and you want to help support us, check out patreon.com slash workbench. And as always, I am Joe, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye.